Thank you. Thank you very much. Now this week, uh, my subject, as Mark mentioned, is going to be uh, history as a struggle for liberty. Uh, this conception of history, of what history is, um, goes back to Lord Acton, a uh, famous uh, 19th century uh, historian, uh, who all his life, spent all his life accumulating uh, notes and materials for what would be, he thought, his great history of liberty. The greatest book never written, people say. Uh, nonetheless, Acton wrote many essays on the subject, and uh, he's a historian well worth consulting. What I'm going to be discussing this week is uh, classical liberalism. I might slip and just call it liberalism from time to time, so you'll understand what I'm saying. We'll be discussing its growth, its development, and finally, I'll say something about the possible future of liberalism. Now, the history of classical liberalism is intertwined in the history of Europe. Europe and its outposts, especially America. The Europe that sometimes has been defined as extending from Warsaw to San Francisco. And one might uh, um, amiably throw in also Vancouver and Melbourne. Some people would consider this a very Eurocentric kind of approach. Uh, well, so... Is the history of modern science, Eurocentric. Um, but anyway, the story that uh, I'm going to be uh, outlining uh, will serve as an antidote uh, to what some of you at least have experienced in your high schools and colleges, and that is the demonization of Europe and Europeans as mass genocidal murderers and imperialist exploiters. Uh, if you doubt that this is standard in American education uh, today, then you can uh, um, read the works of uh, uh, Alan Kors, uh, professor at uh, Penn, uh, who is specialized in this, a great scholar of the French, uh, of Fr France and the French Enlightenment uh, otherwise, but has made it a point to uh, um, detail how uh, this demonization takes place uh, through sensitivity uh, training and uh, many other uh, respects. Now, this view of the Europeans as genocidal murderers and demons and so on, much could be said about this. I'm not going to go into any great detail. The first thing that comes to mind uh, is that uh, Europeans, like everybody else, uh, are subject to original sin and uh, have a procliv proclivity uh, uh, to temptation of uh, putting their own uh, self-perceived um, interests uh, above others. Uh, to any extent that they feel necessary. Uh, another thing that could be said is that power corrupts, as Acton famously said, and in the modern period, it's Europeans who had the power. Um, it would be interesting to, to see what would have happened if it had been the Aztecs who landed in Spain <laughs> rather than the other way around and what scenes we would have witnessed. Uh, Aztecs famous for their... Um, mass uh, ritual murders and cannibalism. And then finally, I want to say that uh, there were Europeans who opposed these various crimes of the men of power in their own countries. And uh, they, among them, among the most prominent, were the classical liberals that we'll be talking about this week. Now, the first thing to say about uh, liberalism is that it arose in Europe, uh, specifically in Western Christendom. Uh, the Europe that grew up in communion with the Bishop of Rome, one time or another, so that the history of Europe and the history of liberalism uh, are intimately intertwined. The question of why this should be the case has given rise to an enormous literature. And in this talk, as for all of my talks, if you have any questions about sources, and bibliography, and so on, I'm going to be here the whole week, so feel free to ask me, and I'll either give you some uh, references uh, uh, now, or I'll, I'll uh, email you um, more than, probably more than adequate um, uh, references. This uh, approach to, uh, to trying to find out why Europe was different, why Europe was distinctive, is uh, sometimes called the institutional approach of economic historians 
uh, or uh, what I'll title today's talk could be called The European Miracle, uh, after the title of a book by uh, one of the major authors of this uh, uh, approach, uh, E.L. Jones, the Australian economic historian. The miracle in question consists uh, in the simple but momentous fact it was in Europe that human beings first achieved per capita economic growth over a long period of time. Uh, in this way, European society, society eluded the Malthusian trap. Uh, and this ena enabled new tens of millions, just hundreds of millions really, to survive and enabled the population as a whole to escape the hopeless misery that had been the lot of the great bulk of the human race in earlier times. The question is, why Europe? <coughs> Why is Europe in this way set apart from other great civilizations, China, India, Islam, and so on? Geographic factors uh, played a role, no doubt, but I think that Mises put his uh, finger on the essential point when he wrote the following. The East lacked the primordial thing, the idea of freedom from the state. The East never raised the banner of freedom, it never tried to stress the rights of the individual against the power of rulers. It never called into question the arbitrariness of despots. <clears throat> and first of all, the East never established the legal framework that would protect the private citizen's wealth against, against confiscation on the part of tyrants. You know, by the way, this is typical of Mises. Mises was not primarily a historian. Uh, as in my view, um, uh, on the basis of uh, what I know, uh, he was the greatest economist of the 20th century. Uh, on the other hand, he had this ability to put his finger on the uh, solution to some, some historical problem uh, in a way that other professional historians weren't, weren't able to do. Um, we'll see when we discuss the Industrial Re Revolution later on. The same, uh, he did the same thing there. Um, now, the question is, still, why was Europe in this kind of position? Now, one of the authors uh, in this general uh, school of thought that I'm talking about, John Bechler of uh, Paris, uh, by the way, it's an international movement. Uh, Americans, uh, uh, Brit uh, British, uh, uh, French, Australians, I already mentioned. John Bechler, in the pioneering work, pointedly expressed it. The as he said, the first condition for the maximization of economic efficiency is the liberation of civil society with respect to the state. The expansion of capitalism owes its origins and raison d'etre to political anarchy. Uh, we'll see what that, uh, uh, what that means. Uh, among others who have um, uh, developed this is uh, Douglas North. Uh, who won a Nobel Prize in economics for his uh, uh, work in this area, uh, in economic history. And North wrote, it was precisely the lack of large-scale political order that created the environment essential to economic growth and ultimately human freedoms in Europe. Now, this institutional approach was un uh, 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 adumbrated by John Hicks, another Nobel laureate in economics in the late 1960s. But uh, the essentials of the view was, were sketched by a great economic historian, now emeritus from Harvard, David Landis, who, by the way, is no particular classical liberal, but he's a good historian, in uh, a book of his called uh, The Unbound Prometheus. And Landis said there were two factors that set Europe apart from the rest of the world the scope and effectiveness of private enterprise, and the high value placed on the rational manipulation of the human and material environment. Um, and he continued, the role of private enterprise in the West is perhaps unique. More than any other factor, it made the modern world. Um, well, still, why was there this scope and, uh, and leeway for private enterprise? Uh, Landis also points to the radical decentralization of Europe, what Bechler had called its political anarchy, and this is what he writes. 
Because of this crucial role in a context of multiple competing polities, the contrast is with the empires of the Orient and the ancient world, private enterprise in the West possessed a social and political vitality without precedent or counterpart. Now, of course, there was, it wasn't a linear progression to uh, some kind of uh, uh, libertarian uh, utopia. Uh, however, we're talking relatively and in contrast to the other civilizations. Um, keep that in mind. There's radical decentralization uh, based on uh, a, uh, con- a context of multiple competing polities. <clears throat> Bachelor, uh, as others would uh, might well have written, says that this is the crucial non-event of European history. After the fall of Rome, no empire was able to uh, arise in Europe to establish hegemony over the, over the continent. There was no universal empire, although it was tried from time to time. Um, instead, Europe developed into a mosaic of kingdoms, principalities, city-states, ecclesiastical domains, and other political entities. Within this system, it was highly imprudent for any prince to attempt to infringe the property rights in the manner that was customary elsewhere in the world. Uh, And these authors, again, I want to emphasize, they're not doctrinaire, if you want to call it that, uh, libertarians or free market people for the most part. They're simply very good uh, uh, historians, and they talk about the um, uh, customary behavior of states as based on predatory taxation, and continual confiscations. Uh, states throughout history have acted like the mafia does in some neighborhood, if there existed the mafia, which I can tell you that it doesn't. But if the mafia d- did exist, in particular ethnic neighborhoods, uh, what they would uh, very often do is pick out somebody who's, who rises above the rest, that has uh, uh, higher assets, a successful doctor or small businessman, and then the extortion starts with him. And this is what states have typically done uh, through uh, history. What these uh, and confiscations and predatory taxation, taxation of the of the victim uh, uh, to the degree it's uh, it's possible. Sometimes, in the case of the late Roman Empire, uh, taxation beyond what what was uh, natural, uh, what was uh, rational, even for the predatory state, because the victim died. Uh, from uh, excessive uh, taxation and regulation and inflation and so on. Now, so what does the um, uh, decentralization of Europe have to do with this? It created the uh, indispensable condition for what we're calling the European miracle, and that is the possibility of exit. A term used by these by these uh, scholars. Um, to take an example, supposing you're a, a successful businessman in um, an, uh, Antwerp or um, uh, Amsterdam, and uh, this did not happen historically because the rulers of these areas engaged in what was even from the state's point of view rational behavior that is relatively light taxation and a relatively light hand, and respect for private property. But supposing that uh, you were uh, oppressed by the state, that the state was um, uh, confiscating or heavily taxing your assets, you could exit, okay? You could exit within the whole cultural area of Christian Europe. You didn't have to go to a totally different civilization, Okay, you could go across the North Sea to England. You could go down the Rhine River to Cologne, the Bishopric of Cologne, Archbishopric of Cologne. Okay, do you understand? And this held generally among the Italian city-states. It certainly held, since it was very easy to go from one to another, depending on how the state was uh, uh, was treating you there. Now, this did not hold in every case, but it was a constant factor, and the possibility of exit. Um, created limitations to what the state uh, could do uh, to its uh, productive citizens. Now, um, this story goes back many centuries. It goes back into the Middle Ages. And uh, by the way, this uh, um, historical interpretation I'm giving you 
is, has also been uh, the basis of the works of other scholars. Peter Bauer, for instance, the great uh, uh, Peter Bauer, who died uh, a few months ago, in his uh, work on economic development, economic development of Europe, vis-a-vis economic development of the third world, uh, simply assumes uh, this basic interpretation of why uh, Europe uh, grew uh, rich. Um, or uh, uh, Paul Kennedy of Yale, in that book uh, on the rise and, uh, and decline of the great empires, assumes this basis um, as his basis, this interpretation. Or William McNeil of Chicago and his other synthetic uh, works on, on, um, uh, on European history assumes this as a correct interpretation. And Peter Bauer said in one of um, his essays that this economic development goes back at least seven, eight centuries, which means into the heart of the Middle Ages. So we have to examine something about the Middle Ages to explain why Europe was different. And in fact, it is in the Middle Ages that what we call Europe, Europe not the geographical continent, but Europe the civilization, uh, came into existence. Um, Here, there are a number of important factors. Um, Feudalism, that is the European uh, version of feudalism, played a role. Uh, In Russia, for instance, there was a a nobility, however, it was based on state-appointed dukes, uh, archdukes, counts, and whatever. In Europe, feudalism was based on a contractual relationship between powerful lords uh, and the king. Contractual, that is, there were obligations and duties on both sides. And uh, already some limits was, were placed on what the, the prince or the king might do. Um, within each of these realms, which were relatively small anyway, there was often a struggle for power, and this gave rise to distinctive European institutions. Again, distinctive as part of the general distinction of Europe. Representative bodies. Uh, which didn't exist in other uh, civilizations, representative bodies of the tax-paying public. And we'll get into that in a a while. There were parliaments, or in France, the Estates General, uh, or the provincial estates in uh, Castile, the Cortes. Uh, But they existed throughout Europe. There was, I think, no area of Europe that didn't have such a parliamentary representative uh, body. Uh, Certainly the different uh, uh, parts of the Low Countries did. Scandinavia also. Uh, Castile, when I mentioned the Cortes, but there was also a Cortes in Aragon, uh, there was a parliament in Sicily, in Naples, in the German states, and in Hungary, and uh, in, in Poland, uh, throughout uh, uh, Europe. Uh, princes often found their hands tied by charters of rights, which they were forced to grant their subjects. Uh, the Magna Carta is the best known of these. I'll talk about this in a, in a few minutes, but there were many others. And uh, we'll uh, mention the uh, Low Countries later. So I should say um, there's a famous um, um, similar document called the Joyous Entry of Brabant, which each ruler of what is today Belgium and uh, the Netherlands and Holland uh, had to agree to on his ascension to power. Uh, This stipulated that no new taxes were to be uh, imposed without the uh, consent of the various diets of the different parts of what are today Belgium and, uh, and the Netherlands. Uh, no new um, uh, customs, uh, contrary to the traditions of the areas to be introduced, no foreign office holders, and so on. So in other words, what we had in that very important area of uh, the Low Countries, similar to the, to the Magna Carta. Now, perhaps more crucial than anything else in the whole distinctive development of Europe was the existence of a powerful international church uh, whose interests were not synonymous or often really compatible with the interests of the state. (coughs) Lord Acton, who was a Catholic, emphasized this, but it's not something that you have to be a Catholic in order to agree to. I mean, it's a question of what is actually the historical development. Um, And you could be a free thinker, you could be a Protestant, and uh, and as as a matter of fact, uh, today there are scholars um, uh, who are not Christians at all, uh, who think that the role of the Catholic Church uh, was crucial. Now, we should not be uh, con- we should not be thinking of, and in and, and this context, uh, uh, we're not involving ourselves with 
the post-Reformation, or especially the, pro, the, uh, the post-French Revolution church. There, there were problems, and you found the state of the uh, church coming closer to the state, coming closer especially to Catholic rulers, and each one using the other. The critical point was, again, the Middle Ages. And there you had a, um, an adversarial position between the church and the state that was, in fact, crucial. And it goes back even before the Middle Ages to the first centuries of the church. Uh, when I was, there may be those of you, of you who, um, uh, who are addicted not only to uh, LouRockwell.com, which of course is a mass phenomenon now, but the uh, LRC blog, okay? And um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they could have LRC blog 2, blog 3, and so on, and still wouldn't be enough for me. Uh, you might have noticed that I had an item, I think it, it was uh, it was on the blog, uh, about a, uh, uh, a, a, a terrific painting I, I uh, saw at the National Gallery in London uh, recently that I had never been aware of. Um, it was by Van Dyck, uh, a Flemish um, a painter, and it showed uh, St. Ambrose uh, blocking the entrance to the Cathedral of Milan to the Emperor, Emperor Theodosius. Because Theodosius had been involved in the massacre of many innocents in Thessalonica and the eastern Mediterranean, and uh, this was considered a sin that, uh, uh, by St. Ambrose. Uh, that um, uh, the emperor had not uh, repented of. Uh, this was around uh, late 4th century, so it's not the great Duomo of Milan that you see now, but it was a forerunner cathedral. And St. Ambrose, of course, was the archbishop of Milan and the man who uh, converted St. Augustine uh, to uh, Christianity. Uh, so the painting demonstrates, and it's a small group of people, uh, demonstrates uh, in a very uh, stark kind of way that the Archbishop is standing there in front of the doorway, and the Emperor Theodosius had never experienced such a thing. You can see that he's, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, enraged, uh, he's uh, uh, totally frustrated. What is this churchman doing preventing me from entering a building of my empire? Um, but uh, the Emperor is not permitted to come into the building. Now this is Another example of the conflict between Ambrose and Theodosius. Um, Theodosius demanded that Ambrose hand over the cathedral to the emperor. And Ambrose responded, uh, It is not lawful for us to deliver it up, nor for your majesty to receive it. By no law can you violate the house of a private man. And do you think that the house of God may be taken away? It is asserted that all things are lawful to the emperor, that all things are his, but do not burden your conscience, conscience with the thought that you have any right as emperor over sacred things. Uh, it is written, God's to God and Caesar's to Caesar. The palace is the emperor's, the churches are the bishops. That, that uh, a statement, by the way, of course, comes from the New Testament. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, unto God what is God. And Lord Acton had, uh, had uh, early in his career, identified that as, in his view, the origin of the idea of liberty. That is, that there is a realm that is not the state's. Okay, division now between what belongs to the state and what belongs to God. Uh, whereas um, ancient polities, uh, the Greeks and the, and the Romans, and especially the later Roman Empire, uh, did not make this distinction between uh, what belonged to the state and what belonged to the gods. Uh, the late Roman Empire, the, the emperors themselves were gods. Um, now, as a matter of fact, uh, Ambrose, uh, who was, res- as I mentioned, responsible for the um, uh, conversion of uh, St. Augustine. Well, now with St. Augustine, we have an interesting development in his uh, work on the city of God, what has been called the desacralization of the state. The desacralization of the state. In the Roman Empire, Roma was a god. Uh, with the, uh, particular sacrifices and, uh, and religious obligations due to this god representing the Roman state. Among the sacrifices, um, the very um, uh, stark kind of sacrifices were the ones that you would see in the Colosseum, the sacrifices of, Roman, of Rome's en- enemies uh, in, uh, in, in 
in ways that are not even shown on Fox TV today. Um, so this, uh, but uh, but uh, what uh, Augustine said was that this is the Rome, Rome Shmoom. You know, this is the city of man. What is important is the city of God, our uh, eventual and permanent uh, uh, habitation, and the city of God is infinitely more important than the city of man. Desacralizing the state, which had been considered godlike uh, by the Romans. Um, now, and much could be said about this uh, 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 adversarial um, and, uh, position and um, hostile interaction between the state and the, uh, and, uh, the, and the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. One important thing to keep in mind is that um, this did not hold for Christianity in general. In uh, Byzantine Christianity, for instance, there prevailed what's called Caesaropapism, and that is uh, the situation where the church was pretty much under the thumb of the emperor. And this was characteristic of Greek Christianity, and this is the kind of Christianity that the Russians uh, inherited. So that under the uh, Russian rulers and the Tsars, the Tsars as they took that title, uh, they were uh, effectively in charge of the church. Different kind of situation from from Europe. And again, uh, we come across this idea of decentralization, division of power. Um, it was important because of the different small decentralized polities, and especially this big division between the state and the church. Whereas in other civilizations, the, the ruler himself was God. I mentioned Rome or Pharaoh uh, or uh, the uh, emperor of uh, Japan, the direct uh, descendant of the goddess of the sun or the emperor of China and so on. Uh, it was quite different in, uh, in the West. And um, we can see this in a number of different ways. And the role of the uh, church, you know, I was talking to Mark before about uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, students, and I don't understand why uh, this happens. It is almost literally impossible for me to um, convince my students that the Middle Ages were not the Dark Ages. Okay? Uh, this was maybe the biggest, uh, or one of the biggest, next to the myth of the Industrial Revolution, Revolution. Uh, one of the biggest um, um, historical frauds perpetrated by Renaissance humanists and uh, French uh, philosophers. Uh, Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. Right? Yeah, right, right. Go and see Chartres Cathedral. You know, or read uh, Dante, the Dark Ages, or Thomas Aquinas, right? The Dark Ages. Um, but uh, and one one thing in particular I tell my students is that in the Middle Ages in the high Middle Ages, after scholastic philosophy had been established, uh, it was universally taught in every university from Oxford to Salamanca to the Jagiellonian University of Krakow that the prince was under the law. The ruler himself had to obey the law. Okay, Then, on an exam, um, which are becoming increasingly simple, uh, because I don't want to flunk the whole class, right? It doesn't look good. There's a true or false question. Uh, in the Middle Ages, it was considered that the ruler, the prince, could do anything he wanted. True or false? Almost everybody writes true. Okay? Even when I tell them, as I'm teaching the course, write this down. <laughs> okay? It doesn't make any difference. And uh, when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, I think it'll, we'll see the same thing. It doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference what economic historians say. Still, everybody has in their mind some picture of the Industrial Revolution as causing uh, uh, infinite misery to, uh, to working people. It's impossible to eradicate. Well, uh, I don't know if you know the name Jacob Viner, who's a great economic historian and, uh, and scholar at the University of Chicago. And um, he mentions, for instance, um, uh, a reference uh, to... Uh, to taxation by St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, where uh, Viner says Aquinas treats um, taxation as more or less an extraordinary act of a ruler, which is as likely as not to be morally illicit. 
And, and uh, Viner points to a medieval bull by a pope, papal bull, uh, republished every year into the uh, late 18th century, which threatened to excommunicate any ruler, quote, who levied new taxes or increased old ones, except in, uh, for cases supported by law, by an express permission from the Pope. Well, the last part, uh, you know, the, the Catholic, uh, the uh, uh, popes were, were not in into this adversarial situation for their for their health. It was a, a question of one power against another power. It was good for us that there was a countervailing power to the state in the West that did not exist in other civilizations. But nonetheless, here Thomas Aquinas himself uh, talking about taxation as probably illicit, uh, new taxes is illicit, and this papal bull is saying that they were not permitted except with papal uh, control. By the way, there's a series of um, books published by Stanford um, under the uh, general inspiration of, um, of uh, uh, John Hexter, and uh, one of them, for instance, is called The Origins of Modern Modern Freedom in the West. <clears throat> uh, uh, I, have a, I have almost all of them, and they're mostly very, very useful. Um, here's a quotation by one of the contributors to this volume, The Origins of Modern Freedom in the West. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, Professor Koenigsberger. Almost everywhere in Latin Christendom, the principle was, at one time or another, accepted by the rulers, that apart from the normal revenues of the prince, no taxes could be imposed without the consent of parliament. By using their power of the purse, the parliaments often influence the rulers' policy, policies especially rest restraining them from military adventures. Um, now, that, all of that is important. The um, parliaments, uh, in England, for instance, the House of Commons, as well as the House of Lords, um, in the Italian uh, uh, city-states, in the Low Countries, the representative assemblies would, were uh, elected generally by taxpayers. Very different from the modern situation, where you have mass electoral democracy, and uh, now the income tax is being uh, 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 given back to uh, uh, people who are uh, paying low taxes, so it's a smaller and smaller part of the population that pays the income tax in the United States, uh, whereas the rest of the people have an interest in increasing taxes, since they feel they can get benefits from it. But in the Middle Ages, into the modern period, it was taxpayers who were represented in these different uh, uh, assemblies. Um, so when people talk about, let's say, the democratic um, uh, factor in, uh, in the, uh, the Dutch cities or in the Italian uh, city-states, it's not to be understood in the, in the sense of present-day democracy. Uh, it's not mass democracy by any means. It's democracy of the uh, taxpayers. And that was uh, what was involved uh, in these assemblies. Now, I mentioned representative assemblies. Um, there was also the, uh, the, general neo -scholast uh, the general scholastic philosophy of uh, natural law. And I mentioned the different <coughs> charters uh, granted by rulers. Um, and um, uh, acting as um, sets of limitations on their power. The most famous is the Magna Carta uh, in English history. Um, not famous to my students, um, who I think, are, uh, you know, they're not that bad. They're just kind of average. Uh, but um, they've, uh, they've all heard of a, of a lady called Harriet Tubman, I don't know, maybe somebody can tell me afterwards who's, um, many, many fewer of them, virtually none of them, uh, know who Martin Luther King was named after. And as for, uh, as for things like the Magna Carta, well, it's a, pretty much of a mystery. The, <clears throat> the barons, the barons of England, uh, the, uh, uh, lords, spiritual and temporal, forced bad King John, to sign this great charter, the Magna Carta. You can look it up. Um, it's not very long. And naturally, considering the age it comes from, uh, there's a good deal of the, of the medieval to it. 
explicitly and also in the general uh, tenor. Uh, nonetheless, what's being establishment, uh, what's being established comes through. Uh, here's one chapter: No scutage nor aid, uh, basically taxes, uh, shall be imposed on our kingdom unless by common council of our kingdom. Already now we have the beginning of uh, the right of a representative assembly to okay new taxes, except for ransoming our person or making our eldest son a knight, um, and for once marrying our eldest daughter. Okay. So, in other words, you have the medieval element there, but nonetheless, a limitation uh, on uh, on uh, arbitrary taxation. There has to be a common council involved. Uh, another item: No constable or other bailiff of ours shall take corn, that is, in the British sense, that is uh, grain, or other provisions from anyone without immediately tendering money. Therefore, unless he can have postponement there. Of by permission of the seller. Can't simply send the soldiers out among the peasants and and take their um, uh, take their uh, harvest away. Can't act like the Bolsheviks in the Ukraine. Here's another one: No sheriff or bailiff of ours or other person shall take the horses or carts of any freeman for transport duty against the will of the said freeman. Horses or carts. Obviously, uh, agricult- basically agricultural society, but uh, the king's men can't just go in and take it because they need it. Uh, they have to pay for it. No freeman shall be taken and imprisoned or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him nor send upon him except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. Okay, the rule of law and trial by jury. Uh, another item, all merchants shall have safe and secure exit from England and entry to England with the right to tarry there and to move about as well by land as by water, uh, except in time of war, uh, such merchants uh, uh, being from the uh, uh, land at war with us. Um, and if they, uh, such are found in our land at the beginning of the war, they shall be detained without injury to their bodies or goods. Again, respect for private property, for commercial freedom, even for enemy aliens. Um, okay, many other items that uh, are irrelevant uh, now. And then, uh, this, this is longer than it seems because it's both in Latin and in English. Finally, whereof, and this is what the king was forced to sign, whereof it is our will and we firmly enjoin that the English church be free that the men of our kingdom have and hold all the aforesaid liberties, rights, and concessions um, fully and wholly for themselves and their heirs by us and our heirs. Um, Pledging the uh, future rulers of England uh, to these these rights. Uh, Given under our hand in the meadow which is called Runnymede, (laughs) between the rivers Windsor and Staines on the 15th of June, in the 17th year of our reign, in the year of our Lord, 1415. Now, a committee is set up of the barons to enforce this, to make sure that bad King John uh, does what he promises to do. And the first name on the committee is Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury. A Catholic Archbishop, of course, in those days. So what you have here is, the, in this case, the Catholic Church throwing its weight into the balance against the power of the uh, of the secular ruler. I want to emphasize that this is not something that uh, that you have to be a Catholic uh, to believe by any means. It's a, a certain interpretation of medieval history and the rise of the West, which many people who are not Catholic, I'll take P.T. Power, for instance, who is a Budapest Jew, um, uh, also. Uh, adhere to. Now, we can make clearer what's involved here if we contrast Europe with other um, other civilizations. With the East, or with another Christian civilization, that is uh, that is uh, Russia. Uh, 
Already the contrast of the East was an established view in the Middle Ages uh, themselves. Um, in the um, 13th century, the um, German emperor, Frederick uh, II, uh, uh, Hohenstaufen, who was um, uh, called by some, has been called by some the first totalitarian ruler. That is, he tried as much as he could to establish totalitarian control. He was a ruler of, and uh, he was a Holy Roman Emperor and, and uh, ruler of Germany, but he made his court in the south of uh, of Europe. Uh, he prohibited uh, the uh, um, inhabitants of Sicily or Naples from going to other places to study uh, at the university. He wanted to keep control. He established uh, must be a prototype of the secret police. Um, and he was involved famously in a, in a conflict with the papacy and defeated ultimately. In one of his writings, Frederick praised happy Asia, Felix Asia, by Asia meant anywhere in the East, as he says, where rulers need not uh, fear the weapons of their subjects and the machinations of priests. Okay, putting together two very interesting uh, elements, that is the right to keep and bear arms, which the Europeans uh, had, which the late Romans um, had abandoned, but which the Germanic people made into a sign of a free man from the uh, early uh, years. And in fact, while there were still barbarians on the other side of the uh, Rhine, um, when they would get together in council, something was being suggested by the chieftain, the freemen would um, uh, signal their agreement by clashing their arms together, their weapons together. And um, that became, among the Anglo-Saxons, a um, settled individual right. I'll probably mention in some of the lecture. Um, so what uh, Frederick uh, II hated was the fact that, the, uh, that his subjects seemed to have weapons all, uh, all around the place. Um, the Iraqi people, as you know, uh, being uh, uh, helped towards ultimate freedom and self-determination by taking their guns away. Um, and also, uh, 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 Frederick II uh, uh, was worried about the machinations of priests, uh, trying to subvert the, the ruler at all times. Now, we can go on to the 17th century. There was a famous Frenchman named Francois Bernier who visited um, really many different places. He was a um, uh, trained as a physician at the famous... Uh, uh, um, medical school at Montpellier in the south of France. So, as a physician, he well, went to many different places, and he was even down in Ethiopia, Persia, but especially in India, and wrote about his um, his experiences there. Um, and his return to France, he published travels in the Mughal Empire, that, that is the empire over India, uh, which incidentally later became the basis of Karl Marx's concept of the Asiatic mode of production. Um, this is what Bernier says. Because of the cupidity of the tyrant, when wealth is acquired, the possessor studies by mean, the means by which he may appear indigent. In the meantime, his gold and silver remain buried at a great depth in the ground. Remember the Arabian uh, uh, Nights uh, stories about the treasure, maybe sometimes guarded by cobras or something? gold and silver and diamonds and so on. Why, why do people have treasure in that form? Why, do they, why are they hiding their wealth? Right? The, the Dutch did not hi, hide their wealth, as we'll see. Right? They put their wealth into the herring boats that traveled throughout the North Sea and into the Baltic Sea. Enormously productive, even for the late Middle Ages. Okay? Why in the East was this uh, a custom established of hiding wealth on the part of productive citizens. Bernier gives the reason, and uh, confirmed by uh, historians, uh, because there was no rule of law protecting private property. And when property uh, accumulated to a certain degree, the tyrant, who has the soldiers, who has the, uh, the guns or swords, uh, simply went and confiscated it. Um, this is Bernier. The nations of Asia have no idea of the principle of mayum and teum, of mine and thine, relative to land or other real possessions. 
And having lost that respect for the right of property, which is the basis of all that is good and useful in the world, necessarily resemble each other in the essential points. They fall into the same pernicious errors and thus have to suffer tyranny, ruin, and misery. And much more along the same lines from Bernier on the basis of his personal experience. Now, one interesting thing about this is that um, uh, many of these observations were written to um, the minister of Louis XIV, Colbert. Now, in the history of European economic uh, development, Colbert is known as kind of the ideal type of the mercantilist minister. You follow what I'm saying? Now, my point is that even um, in regard to a, a, a minister who is not the total believer in free trade, Bernier is saying the East doesn't even have what we have in France, basic protection of private property. In other words, Colbert would go down as somebody who's really a government interventionist and a really a prime mercantilist, but nonetheless, even under mercantilism, the Europeans had this regard for private property, sanctity of contracts, and so on, that uh, allowed them to develop in contrast uh, uh, to the East. Now, I, I could send you some information, uh, incidentally, uh, in regard to uh, to Japan. Bachelor says, when you want to talk about China, each time China was politically divided, capitalism flourished. Now, in regard to, to Japan, there's a very interesting situation. The stereotype has it that the Japanese were, what, hopelessly uh, backwards in third world and so on until Commodore Perry came and introduced them to, uh, to the modern world. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in the previous centuries, um, uh, about two centuries or so, uh, called the Tokugawa period, uh, Japan flourished economically. And this has been investigated by economic historians who come to the conclusion that the Japanese situation in some ways resembled Europe also. That is, you had a, a feudal class, uh, you had a merchant class uh, with uh, guaranteed property rights in the towns. You had a, a stock exchange in Japan. Uh, you had um, uh, defined rights, including rights to water. Um, you had uh, defined uh, rights of individuals in their own labor. And if you like, I can send you references uh, in this connection. So in other words, you had the uh, uh, kind of a, uh, an institutional infrastructure in Japan in a way similar to the one that existed in Europe. Now, when we talk about Russia, we have a different situation, unfortunately. Uh, and th this is not to say anything against the great Russian people. I mean, everybody, in a way, is a victim of uh, the history that they're, of the society they're born into. And, um, um, and the Russian people are one of the great uh, peoples um, of Europe. Nonetheless, they are burdened by history um, that um, uh, deviates from the from the mainstream history of Europe. Um, it was very very late that uh, any limitations were put on the on the uh, uh, power of the ruler at all. Uh, maybe in the 18th century, uh, with Catherine the Great, uh, who was uh, conver converted to free trade for a while. But if you take Peter the Great, uh, for instance, uh, around the year 1700. Uh, who wanted to modernize Russia. Every once in a while, some ruler comes along and says, you know, Lord, our heavens, we're so far behind Europe, we have to do something about it, let's modernize. Uh, so he built his new capital uh, in, uh, in St. Petersburg uh, with serf labor, of course. Uh, and then he, uh, he had taken a famous trip to Europe. It's a very interesting story, look it up sometime about uh, uh, Peter the Great, and uh, sometimes he was disguised as a, uh, an ordinary... Uh, uh, seaman, uh, but he was, he was stunned by what he found in Europe. And the present Rus Russian flag, by the way, has the same colors as the Dutch flag um, introduced uh, by, uh, by Peter the, the uh, uh, Great. Um, but he saw that Europe had, <coughs> had entrepreneurs, had capitalists, had uh, development of modern in uh, industry, had a high standard of living compared to the Russian masses. Uh, so he decided to do the same thing in, in, um, in Russia, and he began by a, a draft conscription of entrepreneurs um, to put them in charge of new factories, of mines. And what he didn't begin with was, an, was a uh, definition of property rights. 
which by that time had been well established uh, in Europe. And, um, and so this, um, uh, this is a problem uh, uh, through Russian history. What's going to happen to the Russians uh, it would be impossible to say. But there is a case, a uh, history of, um, of a society that deviated from Europe. But we can talk about, and Spain would be another example. Um, now, the book that you're, you've uh, uh, all been reading assiduously, I don't see that everyone has a copy. Mark, where's your copy? Oh, upstairs, okay. Uh, How the West Grew Rich has a few pages on, on Spain that are worth uh, looking at. Um, and there, of course, is a, a whole other literature that uh, is in support. But we can take a positive example and positive model from the European development, and that is the, the Dutch experiment. The, the Low Countries, that is what is today basically the Netherlands and Belgium, had long benefited from the legal system inherited from the Dukes of Burgundy, who ruled the area. Uh, these rulers, uh, who governed in collaboration with the States General, uh, the States General uh, uh, means a, um, uh, a meeting of, uh, of representatives of all of the estates, or, in other words, legal categories of noble, uh, commoner, uh, sometimes clergy, and that's called the Estates General. Um, the Dukes of Burgundy and the Act of Estates General promoted an open commercial and industrial system based on the protection of property rights. Natural enough, since the Estates General were, were uh, uh, constituted of representatives of the property-owning uh, classes. In the um, rise of the Northern Netherlands, or the United Provinces, or Holland as we say, we have a near perfect example of the European miracle of decentralization in operation. Um, first, the area had been a major participant in European economic, political, and cultural de developments for centuries, and by the time the Reformation came along <clears throat> in the 16th century, uh, they were about as developed as uh, the, uh, uh, the city-states of northern Italy, uh, which... Uh, 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 were the most developed uh, parts of uh, of Europe, and as I mentioned, the the, the herring uh, fleet was uh, famous and proverbial in in Europe. You know, they had herring boats that not only caught the uh, uh, the herring, but um, uh, dressed them, um, packed them in, in in salt, packed packed them in boxes, ready for delivery as soon as they got back home in, to Antwerp or uh, Amsterdam. Um, and that is, at the end of the, the Middle Ages, an enormous capital investment. Now, it owes, uh, it, now what happened at a certain point um, is that um, the Habsburgs, for whom I have great respect, the later Habsburgs, the um, Habsburgs of Austria-Hungary, um, but now we're talking about the earlier Habsburgs, and in particular the Spanish Habsburgs, not the Austrians. Um, when the Reformation came along, decided to deal with their recalcitrant uh, subjects, um, mainly in what's today the Netherlands, um, who had the uh, nerve to uh, become Calvinist, and also, maybe even worse, uh, the nerve not to pay the new taxes that the Spanish monarchy required because of it, its imperialist um, uh, plans and ambitions. Uh, they were the most uh, productive parts of the Spanish possessions. So, new taxes were introduced without the consent of the particular diets of the different provinces, uh, and also the Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition, was introduced to uh, extirpate uh, uh, Protestantism. This led to the uh, revolt of the of the uh, of the Dutch, the first war of national liberation in uh, modern history. And uh, if you know if students don't uh, don't know who Martin Luther King was named after, they certainly don't know anything about the revolt of the Dutch, which was a, which was a crucial, pivotal event in European history. Um, what happened was that the Dutch, after a long, bitter, bloody struggle, succeeded in uh, separating. 
It was another, by the way, it was a revolt. It was another secession, just as with the uh, American uh, Confederate states. The Dutch didn't want to take over the Spanish Empire. They just wanted to withdraw from the Spanish Empire, as the American colonists wanted to withdraw from the British Empire. And after a very long struggle over decades, the Dutch uh, finally did. And what they set up became a model for Europe for decades. It was the first uh, European uh, economic miracle, Wirtschaftswunder. What happened? There was no king. There was no court. Um, there was a, uh, a united uh, diet for all of the provinces, but each of the div- individual po- uh, provinces, like um, uh, uh, Holland or uh, Groningen um, or uh, uh, the other of the eight provinces, sent their representatives to this united diet who could not uh, pass on anything until their principals at home had agreed to it. In other words, very highly decentralized. Um, and it was basically ruled by a, a mercantile elite, the uh, uh, burghers of uh, Amsterdam and, and so on, and of the other towns. And in a short while, it became uh, even more prosperous than it had been before. There were poor, of course, in uh, what I'll call Holland. It was a major province, so the whole country is sometimes called that. Uh, on the other hand, the poor were much better off than uh, the poor virtually anywhere else in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and um, now, I say this is a perfect example of the European decentralized model in operation for a number of reasons. For one thing, one reason they had been able to defeat the Spaniards is that they had the support of other European countries, particularly Elizabeth, Elizabeth I in England. Understand? In other words, if Europe had been already been one huge empire, they could have easily crushed the Dutch. But since it was divided, they could call on other independent areas to support them. And that was the reason, eventually, why uh, uh, Philip II sent the Armada against the English. Well, besides... Uh, uh, the fact that they were Protestant, because they had given aid to the Dutch rebels. So, and now, now it's set up, it's increasingly uh, uh, prosperous, uh, it's tolerant relative to the rest of Europe, because two-thirds of the people are Protestants, Calvinists, and about a third is still Catholic. Uh, and the um, society is controlled by businessmen, who generally don't like to kill their customers for religious or other reasons. Um, so there was a there was a general toleration, uh, de facto more than uh, uh, the uh, by law. Uh, the Dutch printers were willing to print virtually anything. Now I don't want to talk to the internet generation about virtually anything because your own standards are probably quite different. But what? From, from those days, and what in those days were considered extreme, especially heretical works, considered heretical by one church or another. The, jer- the Dutch printers just cared for one thing, right? Whether you settled your bill. Or not. And they, don't, they didn't care what language. They could, they'll, they'll publish it in French and then it could be smuggled into France. Okay? So this, and, uh, and ha- so ha- Holland became a model that was recognized by uh, by everyone. Here's a, an American historian to say, to say, who wrote, both foreigners and Dutchmen were apt to believe that the Dutch Republic was unique in pr- permitting an unprecedented degree of freedom in the fields of religion, trade, and politics. In the eyes of contemporaries, it was this combination of freedom and economic predominance that constituted the true miracle of the Dutch Republic. One um, characteristic of the, uh, the Dutch Republic was that they welcomed religious dissidents, philosophical dissidents also, like John Locke <coughs> or Descartes, who lived there for a while. But they welcomed um, the Iberian uh, Jews, the Portuguese and Spanish Jews had been thrown out, um, and who therefore set up uh, uh, important Jewish communities in Antwerp, or most famously Amsterdam. And this is what one uh, Amsterdam Jew named Spinoza wrote. The city of Amsterdam reaps the fruit of this freedom in its own great prosperity and the admiration of other people. 
For in this most flourishing state and most splendid city, every men of every nation and religion live together in the greatest harmony and ask no questions before trusting their goods to a fellow citizen, save whether he be rich or poor, and whether he generally acts honestly or, or the reverse. Um, in other words, this is a case of commerce, producing tolerance, okay, producing harmony, producing a willing to, willingness to interact, of course, for mutual benefit. We're not talking about a, a nation of altruists here. But what they discovered was the rule of peaceful interaction for the benefit of all based on respect for private property. Uh, I, I suppose you know that this uh, Jewish community of Amsterdam lasted for quite a while and c- contributed a great deal uh, to the uh, prosperity and, um, and fame of the Dutch. And until uh, uh, around the time of Anne Frank, uh, when it was put a violent end to Incidentally, just a sidelight, uh, as you know, capitalism destroys culture. And the free market is the enemy of any culture. That is why the Dutch, for instance, have never produced any, anything in the way of painting. <laughs> the artists used to, used to create their paintings and have them sold in the grocery store next to the barrel of, of um, salted herring. Uh, it was a very bourgeois society. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whom I'll be talking about a little later on, one of the uh, later in the week, hated the Dutch. Uh, he said, "If you go to Amsterdam and ask somebody the time, they try to charge you for it," <laughs> which I, I don't see anything wrong with, frankly. Um, well, okay, um, I'm going to be talking um, next hour about how the uh, Dutch uh, model was uh, observed and uh, and taken up. Uh, by other Europeans. Uh, As I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, John Locke, when he had to leave England for possible political persecution, spent time uh, uh, among the Dutch uh, and uh, uh, learned a good deal from them. But let's stop at this point. A lot of material has been gone over, and I'm asking for any comments you might have uh, or uh, questions, anything that you'd like to say. Yes. Um, what was it specifically about the medieval church that helped them to counteract the growth of state? That they that it was hierarchized, that they had the hands knife, that they had excommunication behind them. Because I know in comparison with the Middle East, there's a lot more in the Quran about property rights than there is in the Bible. Mm. There was no kind of <coughs> church. Community. Yeah, that, well, uh, you know, I'm not very familiar with the. Uh, with uh, Islam and uh, that aspect of it. Uh, do you want to say a little more about the, what the Quran says about property? We know that uh, Muhammad was a merchant. Yeah. There's, um, there's just sort of uh, uh, religious restrictions on what, what you know, leaders or chiefs can do. Uh, it, there wasn't a whole lot, but there was certainly more than we get in the Jewish church. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's very interesting. But I uh, also know that in Islam there's no organized church at all. There's you know individual leaders mm-hmm. who have whatever authority. That they okay. Have. There, there's the uh, the the uh, <coughs> hub of the uh, question. I would say, um, it's not just as as you can tell from the the case of Russia, for instance, or, or Byzantium. It's not Christian or Ethiopia, for that matter. It's supposed to be a Christian country. It is not Christianity per se that provides limits on state power. Uh, I think it was the, the fact the, of the powerful institutional church, uh, an international church also, so that if you had one particular ruler persecuting the church, well, he knew that he could call on this great international uh, uh, power behind him. Um, and uh, it was the bishops of Rome who built this up over centuries. Um, in the um, uh, 11th century, uh, you had uh, Gregory the Seventh, uh, who was a particularly powerful uh, pope, and who uh, Harold Berman is a professor, I guess again emeritus from Harvard Law. And has written on the history of law and uh, uh, points to the um, um, changes brought about by uh, Gregory the Seventh uh, 
uh, Hildebrand um, uh, and his immediate successors uh, that are, uh, created a, um, uh, deliberately, explicitly, a church that was independent of, of um, uh, secular rule or influence as much as possible and could act as a counterweight. Famously, uh, he brought the emperor of the uh, uh, Holy Roman Empire and the king of the Germans uh, down to um, Canossa in the Italian Alps uh, to, um, uh, to ask for forgiveness and to ask that the excommunication be lifted from him, uh, powerful enough to do something like that. So it was the, uh, the institution of this church, today the oldest institution in the world, um, and I don't suppose all the... Um, uh, people who are, seem to be out to destroy the Catholic Church are going to succeed. I mean, it's, the Catholic Church has seen worse times than this. I'm not Catholic myself, by the way, but I'm just uh, a, um, an observer and uh, sympathetic in many in many ways uh, to the Church. So, um, uh, so the hierarchy, of course, was part of the creation of the uh, of the institution uh, necessary to that. So it was the largest property, largest single property owner. In Europe, uh, so among other things, uh, concerned about uh, heavy taxation, uh, something that they wanted to uh, uh, avoid. Uh, but here you had this split that you don't have in other uh, in other civilizations that was critical. Yeah. One facet of the uh, Arab type of the Islam, even though there was private uh, private property and even uh, ownership of land. The difference was that you, you couldn't inherit the land passed on to your successors, and so that meant there was no improvement of the land. And I guess the individual priest said that uh, princes got the land back, so it, it, you couldn't accumulate <clears throat> you, wealth. Well, well, okay, that, that's what um, Bernier noticed in uh, in um, India. The uh, Mughal control, by the way, was a Muslim control, and the Muslims temporarily controlled India. But you're saying that uh, that that was the case also in Arab. Muslim countries that yes. uh, that uh, really yes. Just a further comment on Islam. Um, of course, Muhammad's first movement and the reason he stuck up to the Quran was it was not only a religious but a mercantile, a nationalist mercantile movement. Sort of the rise of the United Arab trading bloc. And so when they would go conquer another bloc, if you join us, you don't pay taxes. You're within the trading bloc. If you're not with us, we raid you. So on and so forth. Um, but also. Islamic law, uh, I, I think the, the key thing in Islam, even with Christianity, is the idea that, like what Ambrose and Augustine, when he talked about, there was always this um, important point made that the, that the state itself was not sacred, and that there was a separation. Whereas in Islamic, Islamic law, the Sharia, the way of the law, which was codified by Islamic legal scholars, never made a distinction between the path of obeying God's law and the enforcement of the state path. And so, there was even with private property nominally respected, all belonged, um, sort of all was under the jurisdiction of a single power. And this really showed itself later during the Ottoman period, where people in Bosnia, which was under the total Ottoman, merchants there would always send their capital to the Habsburg domain. As soon as they made money, they would immediately funnel it into Austria and help because that's the only place they could save their money. Otherwise, it was subject to confiscation or, like you said, they couldn't pass down to the heirs. That's very, that's very interesting. Um, other comments or uh, questions or anything you want to say? Joe? First, I'm listening to one of the material and felt that sort of was kind of a sort of drawing a list of the uh, about the kind of instability that appeared to be happening in the United States. And then I'm wondering if there's any um, uh, thought out by that in there and what would look maybe and not be. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> and um, along those lines, I mentioned that uh, Bernier's um, uh, travels in uh, in India uh, influenced Karl Marx in his view of the Asiatic mode of production. Now, the Marxist the Marxist uh, 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 view of the different uh, epochs of uh, history. There was the Asiatic mode of, there was first of all primitive communism, then the Asiatic mode of production, then slavery in the ancient world, then feudalism and serfdom, and now, uh, capitalist, uh, um, 
exploitation. And people have noted that uh, Marx and Marxist authors in general never paid much attention to that Asiatic mode of production, which is supposed to have been a stage of economic development. And some people have suggested that, um, especially with modern and contemporary Marxist or Soviet authors, for instance, uh, it came a little too close to home. Because what you had was society under the economic despotism of the state and its bureaucracy. Uh, and um, uh, some critics, for instance, anarchist, uh, left anarchist critics of Marxism said, that's what, um, what, uh, what uh, Marxist um, uh, societies eventuated in. Uh, so that they didn't feel this Soviet uh, uh, historians wrote endlessly about uh, Marxism and these different uh, uh, stages of history did not feel very comfortable talking about the Asiatic mode of production. The Asiatic mode of production in this interpretation um, uh, being copied by, by Soviet economies. The different articles, people from different parts of Europe have different ideas of what uh, oh, sure. Yeah, the, um, I just gave a model, and these economic um, historians of this institutional approach are just uh, suggesting a model. Naturally, there was enormous variation from one part of uh, Europe to another. And just as you had Bernier talking about India as a, um, a, co- a contrast to Europe, you had other authors, famously John Fortescue, talking about England as um, uh, a, um, uh, a, co- a country which really, which really respected property um, in, in regard to lower taxation. Also, in contrast to France, which he said was a country where uh, the uh, ruler, uh, the king, often acted uh, tyrannically and, um, uh, exper- and t- t- took too much of, their, of, the, uh, of the property of, um, of his subjects. So you did have uh, you did have different um, um, situations in different parts of Europe. And uh, English, um, a British, <clears throat> uh, well, I don't know if he's a historian. I think he's more of a sociologist. Named, named Alan McFarlane has written about the peculiarities of, of uh, English development. Uh, McFarlane says that. McFarlane says that really very early, very early on, um, people were generally uh, uh, aware of the contrast between England and the continent. Uh, that um, uh, in England, for instance, there was a much more active uh, pro- mar- market in land, uh, whereas in uh, Europe, land tended to be uh, passed on from one generation to another without much change. Uh, he says that in, in, uh, in England, the nuclear family is against the extended family. Uh, took root very early on um, in uh, in Europe, especially in the uh, in Central Europe and in Eastern Europe. You had a, uh, an extended family situation um, and uh, other differences. So yes, there were there were many differences, and in, in particular, one might point to differences between England and uh, and the rest of Europe. Could you amplify a bit on the pre-revolutionary? Uh, uh, in the um, low country, you said there was a Duke of Burgundy. The Dukes of Burgundy. So quasi independent private property started. What, why did that start so early? What was the. Well, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> we are fortunate at the Mises Institute in having an expert in all things Dutch, <clears throat> not to mention South African. And that, and that is, uh, uh, Joseph Stromberg, who might uh, know something uh, about this. All I know is that uh, this was a a recognized situation at the end of the Middle Ages. And um, um, why why in particular, particular, I don't know. The problem that occurred was that the the countries ruled by the uh, Dukes of Burgundy then passed an inheritance to uh, to the kings of Spain. So that became part of the Habsburg domains. And that created the Problems that are entered in the in the um, uh, revolt of the Dutch. Yeah. Um, you talked about the difference between the earlier Spanish Habsburg and the later Austrian Habsburg. Yeah. Um, what what brought about this? Well, 
Um, Spanish Habsburgs went out of existence at, at around uh, 1700, um, and the Bourbon, uh, Bourbons became the ruling Spanish dynasty, and the king of Spain today is a Bourbon. Um, <clears throat> the, after Charles V, uh, Habsburg domains were divided uh, between the Spanish domains, which his son Philip II uh, inherited, and the, and the Central European domains, uh, including the emperorship of the Holy Roman Empire, which passed to, uh, to another son of his. Um, and then you have, so you have two different uh, uh, developments. All I had in mind really was the uh, Austria-Hungary of the late 19th century and of the 20th century until it was dissolved by the First World War um, and the uh, great intellectual flourishing of Austria-Hungary. And uh, uh, I'm generally a partisan of lost causes. Uh, some, somebody might snide me or remark, maybe that's because, maybe that, that's why I'm a libertarian. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, late Austrian, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire is an example of that. And down here in, um, in Alabama, maybe you can even think of another example of a lost cause that one might be still a partisan of. Yeah. Oh, by the way, now, now why the Spanish Habsburgs were different? But let me just say, say this. This is what um, uh, many people say when they talk about national character. Uh, keep in mind that the Spaniards went through an experience of seven centuries of what they call the Reconquista, of reconquering Iberia from the Moors. Okay, it went on uh, from the high tide of the of Moorish domination in the 8th century until the, uh, the Moors were finally uh, kicked out in 1492. So that there was constant warfare against the infidel. And what defined a Spaniard uh, was not, certainly not language, because there were many different uh, important dialects. What defined a Spaniard was his Catholicism, uh, which one might uh, think uh, easily led to a kind of uh, inflamed uh, uh, religious uh, intolerance, uh, even worse than experienced in other parts of Europe. I enjoyed your uh, comments about trying to teach the Magna Carta because at one time I tried to introduce that subject. Uh -huh. I think it's very pivotal to the development of the West. And uh, as part of that, I would read parts of the Magna Carta and then ask the students to uh, comment on that. And generally, the only comment I got back was, why did they put all that stupid stuff in there? <laughs> right. And, uh, so why did they put all that? That's that's not a good question, Mark. <laughs> We're talking talking about the early 13th century, the scootage and uh, and so on, ransoming the king's person and so on, had to do with the customs of uh, of uh, the High Middle Ages. If that's what you mean by uh, by stupid stuff. Knowing your own uh, uh, has, uh, habits and uh, and preferences, I suppose you'd prefer if the Magna Carta was sort of um, I recite it in a rap kind of way, right? That's what, because I, I, I know I've seen some of the tapes in your car. <laughs> okay. Anybody want to raise any other points? Okay. Uh, yeah, in the back, please. There's a point that Christianity is different in Europe. Now, wait a minute. Hold on a second. First of all, I have a, a sort of a hearing handicap. And secondly, you don't talk like a New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is a sense that the Christianity is individual in the West. In the sense that, well, Christ was the first world. He was like in spiritualist tradition or in the, in the Jewish tradition. And he was like fighting, he was trying to create a kind of sort of individual personality. And the way you read the scripture is basically saying, well, uh, well, like the individual in the West was created by the Christian. By Christian, yeah. yeah. By the way, on second thought, you do speak like a New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, certainly, uh, there was, um, um, Christianity certainly contributed. People customarily say that Europe not, again, not in the sense of geography, but, but Europe as a cultural phenomenon came into existence <coughs> through a, um, 
a melding over centuries of three inheritances, Christianity being one of them, being importantly one of them. Uh, also the classical uh, tradition from Greece and Rome, no doubt about that, that was kept alive, uh, to a degree anyway. Uh, but then also the special customs that were brought, brought in by the barbarians, so-called, especially the different German tribes. Um, the Germans, uh, so then when these th- uh, three came together, let's say around 800, 900 uh, A.D., that created modern Europe. But by the Germans, we mean, of course, not just or what we call Germans today, but the different Teutonic tribes. Uh, the Franks, who gave their name to France, the uh, Angles and Saxons, who gave their name to England, uh, the uh, Lombards, who gave their name to Lombardy, the Burgundians, who gave their name to Bur- Burgundy, all these different German peoples. Uh, who had very different customs from the uh, uh, subjugated uh, inhabitants of the late Roman Empire, the, the uh, defenseless uh, subjects of uh, Roman bureaucratic regulation and taxation and persecution, um, uh, added their their element to, to it. So, and a different sort of uh, personality came out. Uh, let's say national character, but here on a, on a larger scale. And then, of course, there were sub-varieties of that. So, I was reading Paul Johnson, he just explained it. And he said that the Roman had a, a new problem after they, they took this country into the empire, and they had rebellions of peasants. Looking not, not, not a national rebellion, but that adjusted thinking Yeah, well. Yeah, but yeah, the, the peasant uprisings in every society. In Russia, famously, a number of times in the 17th and 18th century. In, in the China, mass peasant uprising in the 19th century. Peasants um, who are at the at the mercy of the um, uh, uh, rulers and soldiers from the uh, uh, from the metropolis and uh, forced to give up their surplus. Uh, uh, product uh, to to keep the cities um, uh, in existence are in a constant uh, uh, state of, uh, in many societies, in a constant state of latent, at least latent uh, uh, revolt. Um, so I don't think that um, it would be correct to say that the, the, the what the peasants objected to were specific um, uh, Taxes or confiscation or uh, some unusual uh, amount of, uh, of uh, financial oppression, but they ne- they never, as far as I know, until the rise of uh, of liberalism, began to uh, generalize this as a social doctrine. Okay, maybe Watt Tyler's uh, rebellion in uh, uh, in uh, um, England was an, was an exception, but generally. They, what they what they objected to were the specific uh, uh, oppressions being um, uh, imposed on them. There was no general ideology that we're, we're human beings like everybody else. We have rights. We have a right to property. Um, so and Paul, you know, Paul Johnson writes too much. Okay. He writes very well, but he <clears throat> so there'd be. Um, uh, uh, I, I take a, some, th- some of the things he says with a grain of salt, certainly. Thank you. Thank you.